What got me interested in this particular topic, um, I'm just going to give you a little bit of an introduction, particularly around that point um, made about censorship, which is that over the past few years, I've been watching um, companies like Facebook, Google, Twitter, other companies like those, um, take on an increasing role as regulators, either of privacy, um, particularly in the EU context, or of speech um, all over the world. And just to give a little bit of background on that, uh, these companies in some ways have been tasked with operating as censors. So when governments request them to, uh, and this takes all sorts of different forms from the proper court document handed to a company to sort of backhanded dealings. Um, and then on the other side of the spectrum, these companies ha be have become censors in their own right, um, which is they have their own rules. They're completely allowed to do whatever they want when it comes to um, deciding what kind of speech they host, particularly in the US. Um, and so just to, in case, I don't, I don't know what people's level of familiarity with, with the law there is, but basically, if you're a social media company in the US, um, you're generally not held liable for speech that you host, which is different than almost everywhere else in the world. Um, there are a couple exceptions to this, things that are really criminal, um, you know, child pornography, things like that. Yes, Google could be held liable if they did not properly act in taking that down. But when it comes to most other things, including hate speech, however you define it, um, these companies generally don't have to take that content down unless they're required to do so by another government. Um, and that's only the case when they have servers or offices in that country. So I don't know which, com which companies have offices here, and I, I should have looked um, in advance at the transparency reports from these companies to see what they take down in Hungary. I'm sure it's actually quite interesting. Um, but basically what this means is that Google, Facebook, whatever, they all have offices in Berlin, so they take down content when the German government requires them to do so. Um, generally speaking, they don't take down content if, say, Saudi Arabia requires them to do so, um, because they're just not legally liable for that. And so, anyway, that, that's just a little bit of the background of what interests me about this. And what particularly got me into this topic around how companies manipulate social media um, and how that affects uh, the sort of perception of reality and geography. Um, there's an example that I'm going to get to later that actually has a really happy ending. Um, I'm not going to spoil the, the surprise. It comes later. And, um, but basically, um, I started to notice where companies were censoring around certain topics. Um, you would have a really good example of this is uh, in the Arab world where I do a lot of work. Um, there have been kind of, you know, a large number of groups centered around things like atheism and humanism. Um, and these pages somehow go down constantly on Facebook. And I thought that was very strange. Like, what interest does Facebook have in censoring atheists? But it turns out that it's because of the way that these sites are uh, regulated and the way that the, um, uh, not regulated is the wrong word, sorry the way that their procedures work for takedown complaints. So if you don't like something that you see on one of these platforms, you can just flag it and the company has to review it and take it down. Um, and whether they, I mean, they, they do this of course in adherence to their own rules, but sometimes things slip through the cracks. Um, and I, th I think that that's kind of an interesting example because clearly there's no legal reason or rules reason for them to be taking down that content and yet it's been happening anyway fairly frequently. And so I started exploring other areas where this was happening and that's what led me to this topic. So without further ado. Ah. Um. <laughs> oh. Oh. oh, okay, there we go. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to start with this example because it's one that you maybe have heard of, um, but it's also a pretty obvious one of manipulating geographic reality. So apparently there are 32 countries around the world uh, where Google Maps will not draw a hard border. Um, and this is because these are disputed areas for whatever reason. If you look at it from here, I can see you know, Egypt, Sudan, uh, Mauritania, Morocco, um, that's Venezuela, right? Yes. Uh, Russia, China, India, etc. And all of these have territorial disputes to some degree or another with their neighbors. And so Google doesn't take a decision on this, they just simply uh, make the line kind of blurry so that everyone's satisfied. I think that this is really interesting for a couple reasons. One is that maps are always political. Um, somebody, whoever's drawing a map, the map is always going to contain some bias or another. Um, it may not be the same bias every time, but nevertheless, maps are not neutral inherently. The second thing is that I just learned this while I was doing the research for this talk. Google Maps, and of course it seems obvious in retrospect, 
they're the most viewed map in the entire world. So more people use Google Maps than any other you know, paper map of any kind, and that's new. That's a fairly recent thing. Um, and so what that means is that Google Maps are essentially de the definitive context or the definitive record that we have for understanding the world. So this really kind of came to the fore last year um, when Russia, or well, <laughs> I don't even know how to define the situation, but everybody's familiar with it. Um, and basically what Google did was um, they really wanted to be careful in this context. So while you had, um, uh, different uh, governments playing off each other, and you know, I, you may have seen the famous example of, um, I think, Canada, right? This is the Canadian representative to NATO um, drew a, a map for Russia that said, Russia, not Russia, just to clarify for everyone what was what. Um, <laughs> Google took kind of a more wishy-washy stance, to use uh, my favorite slang. Um, and basically what that meant was that if you were in Russia, you saw one view of Google Maps, and if you were outside of Russia, or if you were in Ukraine, you saw another version, and if you were outside, you saw another version entirely. And I was really kind of surprised by that, because I knew about the, the sort of flexible borders from that previous article, um, but I didn't realize that they were actually pleasing different governments in different ways. And when I started to dig into this, I found that this is actually a fairly common phenomenon. Um, this is in India. I forget exactly where because it's not something I know the geopolitics of. If anyone knows and wants to clarify that, um, let me know. But this particular spot, you can see at the top, you've got one viewed in India, one viewed in China, and one viewed in the US. Um, the US is kind of irrelevant to this. It considered a stand-in for any other country in the world that is not China or India. Um, but Quartz, uh, QZ.com, they did this article um, and they use this particular example to demonstrate how the map changes. So you can see you've got this hard line here, this dotted line from the US, and no line at all when you're viewing it from India. Um, and it's kind of a fascinating example of how this works. So this brings me to Morocco. So I lived in Morocco for three years, and one of the things that I learned um, that I was kind of surprised by was that, uh, any Moroccans in the room? Because I'm gonna feel bad saying this, no? Okay, it's okay. It's okay, I'm not insulting Moroccans, but every single Moroccan that I've ever met fundamentally believes that the Western Sahara is part of their country. Um, now, for people in Europe, and particularly in Spain, that's shocking, um, because the Western Sahara has been, you know, it's been disputed for a long time. The US perspective usually draws kind of a dotted line and says this is disputed territory. Uh, in Spain, it's a much stronger stance. But in Morocco, it's a very strong opinion that this belongs to uh, Morocco, and in fact, McDonald's a few years ago made a very serious faux pas when they um, did a map where they divided Morocco and the Western Sahara because they just weren't thinking about that, that issue, and it was just on a world map, um, but people were outraged. Um, McDonald's was boycotted for months. It was a big scandal. And so here we have this petition um, to correct Google Maps for Morocco. Um, because Google Maps, even though they do uh, that sort of wavy border, they actually only do it with Algeria. With the Western Sahara, they do draw a dotted line on Google Maps, um, whether you're in Morocco or outside of Morocco. So, people have started a petition on Facebook, of course, where else would you do that, uh, to try to get Google Maps to change their view. So, I was asking people if they could get me an updated screenshot yesterday. I just went on Facebook and Twitter and said, hey, uh, Moroccan friends, can you help me out? And uh, they, they gave me the screenshot and I compared them. They were, in fact, identical. Uh, but then someone said, actually, though, have you looked at Bing? And I hadn't. So I looked at Bing. This is the view from Morocco. Now, normally, you would see a dotted line or a hard line, depending on where you are, right about here. In Morocco, you, oh, ah! In Morocco, you don't see that line. This is a new technology to me. But outside of Morocco, the line is there. So I tested, this is from here yesterday, and that's from Morocco yesterday. So you can see, I wish I'd gotten them identical, but you can see the difference in the two maps. And so I started to ask, okay, why Bing and not Google? Well, the answer is very simple. Google doesn't have an office in Morocco, and Microsoft does. And so Microsoft is bound by the laws of the country, and the laws of the country state that the Western Sahara is part of Morocco. So very simple and obvious answer, um, but still interesting and probably not that noticeable to most people. Wouldn't have been to me. Uh, okay, so this brings me to another example entirely. 
Um, have you ever searched on Google for something like, um, uh, something that has a definitive answer? So if you search, for example, I use this all the time to translate Fahrenheit to Celsius because I'm from the US and we're terrible about this problem, metric, um, <laughs> and I can't think in Celsius. So I'll do something like uh, 31F to C and just type that in and Google gives me a nice little square box or rectangle uh, with an answer. So I've seen some funny things happen in those little boxes. Um, one of them was personal. Uh, I have, somebody created a Wikipedia page about me a few years ago and it says the name of the town that I'm from, which is called Dover, but not the one in England, the one in the US in New Hampshire. Well, um, for a while, if I Googled myself, uh, that little box came up on the side that had my Wikipedia entry, but for some reason, the algorithm was wrong and it said that I was from Dover, England. So there was a whole bunch of, well, I don't think that many people were Googling me, but some people out there in the world thought that I was British, which was kind of cool for five minutes. Um, <laughs> then another one that I saw um, was made some activists in my country pretty angry. Uh, people were Googling who founded Occupy. So the Occupy movement, huge movement that was in the US and other parts of the world, and kind of described by the media at least as a leaderless movement. So, I wouldn't be able to think of who created it. I, I would think, you know, maybe a collective of people, maybe a group of people. Um, but when you typed it in, this guy that I'd never heard of came up. So I thought, huh, that's kind of interesting. So I looked on Twitter, and it turned out other people had noticed this as well and were interrogating him about it. And he said, look, I was part of this, but I didn't found the movement. So what did Google do? <laughs> well, <laughs> they just took his name and put a different guy's name there instead. So now when you Google who founded Occupy, it gives this other guy's name, but unfortunately this particular guy is all too happy to take all the credit for Occupy. So it's a really interesting and contentious issue. So I've seen this happen a few times and I know that these boxes are flawed, but normally there's not a geopolitical implication for the answer um, until this one. So this is just an example of what this normally looks like. I find this really handy because I work in Berlin, my office is in San Francisco, and I constantly have to schedule meetings across different time zones. So almost every day, I, I'm gonna put this down so I don't accidentally ruin the surprise. Almost every day I have to uh, Google what time is it in Pakistan? What time is it in San Francisco? What time is it in this place? Because I can't keep these. I know there's probably an app for that, but just indulge me. So, to give you an example, what time is it in Budapest? When I did that yesterday, it was 3.25 p.m. It said it clearly, it gave me the date, the time zone, and Budapest, Hungary. So it's very clear about where I am and what I'm asking. If there were another town called Budapest and I lived close to it, at the, or my IP address was close to it, it would give me that one instead. So the Dover, England, and Dover, uh, well, Dover, Delaware, Dover, New Hampshire, whatever, uh, it, it just gives you the one that you're closest to unless you specify, which is kind of cool. Now, about two years ago, uh, I had a phone call with a lawyer in Ramallah. Now, Ramallah is a city in the West Bank. The West Bank is a disputed territory, but nevertheless, it's disputed. It's, you could call it Palestinian Authority, you could call it Palestine, you could call it West Bank, but you probably wouldn't call it Israel, unless you're Google. Um, <laughs> so I searched, this, is, this, one's, this screenshot is two years old, um, I had to search my own Twitter account to find it yesterday. But I searched, what time is it in Ramallah? And Google returned this, and it said, time in Ramallah, Israel. And I said, Ramallah's not in Israel. So I tweeted it, and it had many, many retweets, but nothing really happened. And then I remembered that I know somebody who works on Google's policy team, of course. I emailed her, and I just said, um, you might want to tell your engineers that Ramallah's not in Israel. And she wrote back and said, yeah, I know, I've been there, it's really not. Um, and so, <laughs> so they managed to fix it. But here's what's really funny about what they did. Now, <laughs> when you search, there's just no country. That's how they solved that problem. Which, I mean, is a very good way of solving that problem for sure. <laughs> just take away the country entirely and then we never have to handle the issue, which is probably how all sides have been dealing with Israel and Palestine for a long time anyway. But, um, so now, <laughs> it just tells you what time it is in Ramallah. So I thought, okay, I wonder if they've done this with anywhere else in the world. And it turns out that they have. These are just four examples, but I actually, I wrote a blog post where I have about 20 different examples of disputed cities. And with one exception, uh, any place in the world that is disputed, it will not give you a country. 
So I use these for just randomly uh, Golan, if you can't read it, it's Golan, uh, which is disputed between Israel and Syria, Pristina, Kosovo, obviously, uh, Sevastopol, Ukraine, and Abkhazia. Um, and I also did like the Falkland Islands, which is the UK and Argentina. So any, any sort of example, and this is what happens. Um, the one exception to this is Jerusalem, which I thought was kind of funny. I mean, Jerusalem is very clearly in Israel, but it's also disputed nevertheless. Um, but that one, they're very clear about who that belongs to. So Google's made a decision there. They've made a political decision on how they're going to ally, which I think is interesting. Um, but in these cases, they didn't. And I think that, that one's, Golan was a particularly funny one to me because that one's sort of questionably, like, I, I don't know, maybe I just know more about that part of the world. But anyway, I found these kind of fascinating. Um, and I found this one too. This, I, I found this screenshot about September of 2014, so not very long after that, uh, that conflict began. And they'd already taken away the country. So Google had already decided that this was no longer Ukraine which I thought was kind of interesting. OK, my final example. This is the one with the happy ending. Um, so this is a Facebook page. You've seen Facebook pages before, and you probably know that there are different types of Facebook pages. One of them is the type that you create, so a fan page, a page about something that you like, or something, a political party, for example. Um, and then in 2010, Facebook had this idea that they wanted to make sure that there was always a page for whatever you searched for. So they decided to pull content from Wikipedia. Uh, what you can see here is, it, well, you probably can't see it because it's tiny, but it says um, content from the Wikipedia article Micronesia licensed under CC by SA, so under a Creative Commons license. And, <coughs> excuse me. I chose Micronesia just because it was really short. <laughs> um, <laughs> but basically, uh, what it does is it gives you all of this other information about the content. You've got books about Micronesia, related pages, of course, longline fishing, who knew? Um, and indication where of where the content comes from. I kind of think that this is a great idea. Because what it means is that for people, for whom Facebook is the internet. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in a minute, what that means. Um, but basically, if Facebook is your internet, if it's what you use the most, you can still get access to information from it. And access to a relatively reliable neutral source, Wikipedia. I mean, that's another argument for another day. But nevertheless, I think this is a good idea. Uh, just a, a zoom in of that. But <clears throat> a few days ago, or well, Actually, no, it was quite a, a long time ago. I discovered more a couple days ago. But uh, probably about a year ago, I was looking for something. I can't remember what. I was thinking about um, how Facebook was trying to censor terrorist content. Now, terrorist is an interesting thing to define, right? Who decides who's a terrorist? That's an age-old question. Um, but in this case, generally speaking, the US decides. Facebook is a US company. The US keeps a list of, of what they call um, designated foreign terrorist organizations. I think it's about 30 groups, most of which are in um, South Asia and the Middle East and North Africa. Um, but you know, your usual suspects, of course, you have Hamas, Hezbollah, uh, Al Qaeda, these obvious ones, and some that are less known. Uh, I learned about one in Uzbekistan, for example, that I'd never heard of. Um, but basically, these companies ban terrorist content and they try to remove it whenever possible. So if you were to go and create a fan page for, um, let's say, Hassan Nasrallah from Hezbollah, uh, Facebook would probably take that down pretty quickly because it's against their rules and possibly, arguably, against US law. That's another question as well. Um, and I'm happy to answer it later. But basically, um, when they started pulling this content from Wikipedia, I don't think they thought much about this because when I searched a year ago for Hezbollah, it still said that the content was from Wikipedia, but the entry was just completely blank. And I thought, huh, that's kind of interesting. So I started to dig a little bit more. This one's my favorite because the metadata is so funny. Um, the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant, which uh, ISIS or ISIL or whatever you want to call it, Daesh. Um, <laughs> please note the review. I find this hilarious. 2.9 out of 5 stars. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know who's reviewing it. I did review it, but you can't see the reviews, so I, I just I, I wanted to see what would happen. Um, it also shows who's visited, and not who's visited the page, but who says they've actually visited this place. 
you can click on that and it shows you 1,537 people. I hope that you know, law enforcement's looking at that as well. Um, <laughs> it shows you that it's 55 degrees there in Fahrenheit, or was at the time. Um, and then the other funny one is that it calls it a country. That's because, well actually I'm not clear on what that is, um, because Wikipedia doesn't, but this was meant to be pulled from Wikipedia. It does pull from the, um, from the article, or, or did before it was censored. But the funny thing is that country seems to be a tag or a designator uh, from Facebook itself. So whereas when you go back to this one, it, it calls it rightly a political party. It's a terrorist group, but in Lebanon it's also a political party. Here, it calls it a country. <laughs> I found that really interesting. So okay, at this point I had concluded that this must be an attempt to comply with the rules or with the law and that they were censoring terrorist groups. Except then yesterday, I found this one. Now, this is probably a little obscure, um, but the People's Mujahideen of Iran, uh, also known as the MEK, is that familiar to anyone? So about two years ago, there was a huge campaign, uh, mostly from the right in the United States, to get them taken off of the terrorist list. And this campaign was successful. As of two years ago, they are no longer listed as a terrorist organization. They are now considered a legitimate political party. Um, except by Facebook, <laughs> which clearly didn't get the memo that the law had changed. Um, so I thought that was interesting. And then uh, I didn't get a screenshot, but then I... The, the one that I found that got me to make a phone call yesterday, and this is where the happy ending part of the story comes from, um, was that I started to look, what else might be blocked? Is this, if this is not about terrorism, maybe it's about something else. So I started searching sexual terms, thinking, okay, well, Facebook, they don't like nudity, maybe there's something there. No, nope, didn't find, I mean, the worst of all sexual terms, still on Facebook. Um, I started looking up other things, and then it, I found one, and it finally clicked, Nazism. The page that explains what Nazism is, is censored on Facebook. And I thought, okay, that doesn't make any sense. I mean, if, if the goal of these pages, if the goal of pulling Wikipedia content is to provide information to Facebook users about history, about important topics, okay, maybe they think they have to censor the terrorist groups, but why would they think that they have to censor Nazism? And then I looked just to check, and Hitler's not censored. So, I emailed someone at Facebook and just said, can I, I'm giving a talk on this tomorrow, can, can I ask you a couple questions? Turns out, this was a bug. Somehow, um, I, and I'm really excited to say that, and I'm excited that they're letting me say it, but um, somehow these pages got censored by accident. It was like some attempt at compliance with the rules, some engineer made a mistake, and anyway, they've started restoring the content, and I'm gonna send them all the other ones that I find. So it's a happy ending, but it also teaches an important lesson, which is that small mistakes like that can have huge influence. And now, you might be wondering why I think that these Facebook pages are important at all. Um, I'm guessing no one here uses Facebook for research, um, or at least not that kind of research. Right, any dissent? No, okay. Well, so this is why. Um, have you heard of zero rating, or Facebook zero, or internet.org? No? Okay, a little bit, excellent. So the idea behind zero rating, or Facebook zero, these different programs, is to provide at low cost or free, usually free in this case, um, information to people who are not paying for data connections. So if you live in a country that has low internet penetration, most of these are in uh, Africa, Southeast Asia, um, in these countries, people can access Facebook, uh, Wikipedia, and a couple of other things for free uh, without paying for a data connection. It's a great idea. The idea behind it is to provide information to all of the people in the world, um, but it ends up with an interesting bias, because if Facebook is your entry point to the internet, um, and Facebook, as I've, I hope I've made clear, is censored in very strange ways, um, then your view of the world ends up being a bit skewed. So this is a quote from a friend of mine who works for an organization called Access, and she said in a blog post, the internet is more than Wikipedia, Facebook, or Google, but for many zero-rated programs would limit access, so, sorry, but for many, zero-rated programs would limit online access to the walled gardens, uh, so sort of closed spaces, offered by the web heavyweights. For millions of users, Facebook and Wikipedia would be synonymous with internet. I thought, when I first read this, I thought it was kind of a strong statement, but it turns out the research actually backs it up. There was this fantastic article, um, this was also on QuartzQZ.com, which I think probably does the best coverage of this particular topic area of any paper I've seen, or any publication I've seen. 
Uh, they're not paper, they're online. Um, but they said millions of Facebook users have no idea they're using the internet, which again seems like a bold statement, except once you read the piece, the data is really there. They interviewed people, they looked at the different countries where Facebook Zero or internet.org is provided, um, and what they found was that a lot of people didn't, didn't see the world online outside of Facebook. Facebook was their internet, kind of like, uh, I don't know if anyone here used AOL or things like that in the early days, but kind of a walled garden of the internet that you had access to that did not allow you to access the, world the rest of the World Wide Web. And for me, I grew up using one of those, I forget which one, um, not grew up, I was young at the time, 11 or 12, and by the time I got to high school and got to use the rest of the internet, it was kind of a shock because it was a very different world than this narrow, narrowly defined space with bulletin boards and things like that that I'd been previously using. And so I think that that's why this is important because even though that, that previous example was just a mistake, it could still have a big impact. And so when you think about the fact that, yes, Hezbollah might be a terrorist group, they sure, I mean, they certainly have participated in terrorist activities, I'm not denying that. But for people in Lebanon, they're a political party. Same goes for that other example, same goes for examples in Turkey, examples elsewhere. Um, and so when you allow the US government to define how, po what politics look like on social networks, or when you allow them to define based on their own American norms what this looks like, um, you can end up with some really interesting problems, um, particularly when people believe this to be the internet. So that's the rest of my slides anyway. Um, I'm happy to either keep talking or answer questions or both. Um, but I hope that that was uh, enlightening in some way or another.